So good morning everybody and welcome to the 44th meeting of the Economy Committee and the final scheduled meeting for 2020. Um, and just uh, before we start it, I wanted to um, thank members for their very positive con and constructive engagement over the past number of months. It's been a very difficult year um, and I just think that as a committee we worked very well together in terms of trying to respond to the, the absolute unprecedented nature of the crisis that our um, economy um, and we try to give voice to businesses and sectors and individuals right across um, the economy and, and respond and support those and I think the committee has worked very hard over the past number of months and we're willing to do what was necessary and there was absolutely no complaints from members even when we were asking for two or three meetings a week so I just wanted to put on record my thanks and I'm sure all members will um, agree with me that the, the committee staff has been absolutely brilliant uh -huh. supporting us so thanks to too many text messages but otherwise all right <laughs> you know you enjoy them <laughs> they're very good so thank you thank very you. much. I appreciate the chair. So just moving yeah. on then. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference, and our witnesses will be briefing via video conference. The meeting will be broadcast live, and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the assembly website. Um, just to remind members to, to mute their tablet devices by pressing F4. Um, so moving on then to apologies. Uh, we have apologies from John Stewart. Um, and I think everybody else is already with us. Yeah. I think so. Yes. Okay. So, move to if you want um, draft to minutes item number uh, two. Um, three. It might be three. I'm sorry, item uh, number three. three. Um, there is a copy of the draft minutes of the meeting from the 9th of December at page 14 of um, your packs. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Read. Thank you. If you want to go back then and do chairs business and yeah. start doing those. Okay, so if we go then to item number two, which is chairs business, at page five of your pack, there is um, a paper from OCNNI um, Research paper. Um, it's skills and growth and social, sorry, excuse me, skills for growth and social inclusion. The committee has already under, planned to undertake a skills micro inquiry discussion event um, in, at the end of January, the uh, OCNI and I plan to launch their research report on the 27th of January um, and our um, inquiry is the 28th. Um, so uh, they have invited me to sit on the panel and um, I'm happy to do that. So are our members content that, that I would do that? Brilliant. Thank you, Chair. Okay. So then... Um, Second item of uh, Chair's business, members will remember that we had a meeting, an informal meeting with the airports, um, not last Thursday, yes. but Thursday before. Um, you were also... It was a Tuesday, do you remember? It was oh yes, sorry, it was a Tuesday. Tuesday. It was a Tuesday. It was a Tuesday. Tuesday last It was the week before. Um, members will probably also be aware that the Finance Minister has recently announced a further 7.8 million of support for the airports. Um, so if members are content just following on from that meeting and the discussion that we had with the three chief executives, that we would write to the finance and economy ministers highlighting the issues that were raised, including um, APD, PSOs and route development funding, yep. and indicate that the committee's findings in the macroeconomic outlook special report, which was approved by the Assembly last week, highlighted the importance of air connectivity for the recovery and rebuilding of our economy. Yeah, Chair, I think that meeting was useful. I think we were all shocked, I suppose, to realise that the, the airlines or, or the airports are operating at about 20% capacity, yes. which is really drastic when you think, you know, the knock-on effect. There's little or no movement. One, f one flight I understand to London out of the city airport every day, so we really are on our knees as far as our connectivity. So I think, we, to be fair, we welcome the support that has been given through the Finance Minister to the airports, and I think it's, it's much appreciated from the feedback we've got. So I think that needs to be recognised, and uh, it was very timely and appropriate. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. Okay, so moving then to 2.4, um, at page 7 of your table pack, there is a um, key issue summary from for the committee from the department. Um, there was an updated SITREP emails to members yesterday afternoon and I'm sure we'll go into some of that with the Minister when, when she joins us. So, so Chair, we're hoping to get then those have been um, um, 
kind of unpaused, if you like, and we'll get those then every week as we previously did. Um, just updating. Yeah, just it just summarises everything in an easy table. Um, we got? We've got Paul. That probably means them. I want to go back to the okay. ministerial briefing. So we're going to move now to item number four, which is the ministerial briefing. And if we can bring Paul into the spotlight, please. Um. <coughs> Yeah, okay, so... Paul, but that's not the minister. Okay. <laughs> um, Chair, I think the minister's PS is trying to call me. Okay. Bear with me while I take that call. Um, and someone might want to sing Christmassy songs. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, to do I, that. What's, we've got we've got Paul. Paul's on. Oh right, okay. No, he, he appears to be in, 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 in looks like an office. Yeah, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That's awful. So mm -hmm. it's dead, completely dead. The minister is in Netherly, Paul is in Adelaide Street. So that's where the issue appeared to be. So the minister's group are now joining. Okay. Theoretically. Um, <laughs> oh, there we are. There we go. Okay. Okay, so then um, we'll just move to item number four, members. Um, and I'd like to welcome to the meeting this morning the Minister for Economy, Diane Dawes, the Permanent Secretary of the Department for Economy, Mike Brennan, and the Deputy Secretary, Economic Strategy Group, um, Paul Grocott. So if I hand over to yourself, Minister, to make an opening statement, and then we're going to open up to questions from members. Thank you. Okay. Um, is everyone hearing okay? Yeah. 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 We're all good. Good. Thank you. This is a bit strange for me, and I much prefer talking to people um, in person, but we'll persevere today. Um, so, good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to update you on what I and the department are doing uh, in the rebuilding of the Northern Ireland economy. There is no doubt that the pandemic has wreaked havoc on our economy. However, I want to reaffirm my commitment to recovery. My priority is the people of Northern Ireland, their businesses, their jobs, and their livelihoods. And that is why it is so important to keep businesses open, and our businesses need clarity in order to plan for the future. To that end, I continue to approve the launch and operation of grant schemes to help uh, our business community during those periods where it's simply not possible for them to remain open. Paul is here with us um, today and uh, will be able to give greater detail, but I will provide you with some of the headline information now. Today, my department, through the various grant schemes, has provided nearly 350 million of support with the potential for a further uh, almost 194 million once the remaining schemes closed. We have supported over 32,000 businesses so far and will uh, now provide support to thousands more. Today, with the most recent restrictions, we have introduced the COVID restrictions support scheme to provide much needed support to restricted businesses who do not qualify for support through the localized restriction support scheme and businesses in the supply chain of restricted businesses who have been severely impacted. 
Part A of the scheme to date has received 4,027 applications. 3,824 uh, 3, have been processed. 3,444 3, paid. 266 rejected and 14,607,000 uh, pounds uh, paid out. Um, part B of the scheme, which offers support for those operating in the direct supply chain, opened at the end of November. To date, 797 applications have been submitted, 387 processed, 231 paid with just over 450,000 pounds um, being paid uh, to those uh, who have been successful. 130 have been rejected. Um, for those um, who are looking at the figures and ask why is there a difference between those processed and those paid, some of the ones that are processed uh, will be paid when verification documents, etc., cetera, um, have been provided, but they are in the system or under the a £10 million scheme is available for the newly registered self-employed who um, are not eligible for the self-employed income support scheme at the national level. At the start of September, I announced a £1 million digital selling capability grant to help retailers and wholesalers generate online business. We have since been successful in getting an additional £3 million uh, to aid uh, that grant. And a £5 million equity investment fund targeted at early stage and same stage SMEs. At the beginning of October, I announced the £2 million COVID 19 business and financial planning grant, supporting businesses by contributing towards the cost of an advisor to carry out an analysis and strategic review of the business. At the same time, we've also launched the Tourism NI business and financial planning support program to assist tourism businesses in their recovery process. Further schemes to support tourism, local high street businesses and limited company directors are also under development. Developing these initiatives in Spain has been a monumental task, but they have provided vital support to those who need it most. Recovery requires a monumental effort, one that neither I nor my colleagues in the department would shy away from. However, we must work within the constraints of a challenging departmental budget given the very poor financial settlement for the Northern Ireland block grant of 2021-22. The reality is that for my department, a flat baseline going into 21-22 represents a real terms cut of 15%. This is due to inescapable pressures of 54 million, which include 34 million COVID financial tails and the removal of EU funding, of which 70 million is required next year. This is not a sustainable way to support economic recovery. While departmental settlements are yet to be finalised, it is clear that this will be an extremely challenging settlement for my department. The proposed allocation falls significantly short of what the Department for the Economy will need if it is to seriously lead the work to begin economic recovery. And I will value um, the committee's support um, as we seek um, additional funding um, within the budget settlement um, and, of course, uh, throughout the year um, and the various monitoring rounds. Economic recovery will continue to be a priority in the new financial year. EU exit will potentially have an impact in relation to Northern Ireland protocol costs. We believe that around 12.5 million will be needed to fund the Northern Ireland protocol outworkings in 2021-22. And that does not include the cost to businesses that are not protocol specific. There's also a need for significant additional funding to right-size the department and support the additional work being taken forward, delivering economic interventions and supporting economic recovery from COVID-19. Additionally, the impact for my department is compounded due to reliance on EU funding. ESF and ERDF programs have historically funded substantial activity within our policy limit. There's currently a lack of agreement on EU replacement funding at the national level. 
In initial indications suggest that the UK share of prosperity funding will be significantly less than current EU funding. Informal indications suggest 11 million for Northern Ireland. This represents a huge financial risk for the department's ability to support economic recovery. On average, on average EU funding has equated to around 100 million per annum across the department and its arms length bodies with bids for next year being in the region of 70.6 million. My department currently uses ERDF to fund Invest NI's innovation and research and development activity. In 2021-22, this will require 19 million for research and innovation and, and a further 4 million for selective financial assistance to SMEs. Invest NI's budget for this activity provided under the 2014-2020 programme has been exhausted. This is a very serious gap. These projects take time to develop and negotiate, and clarity on future funding is vital for that. For the ESF uh, programme, projects have EU funding in place until March 2022. However, with uncertainties over the future funding, success and policy development has been uh, impeded. The delivery organisations are understandably anxious. To mitigate the risks for both ERDF and ESF, we have bid several times for COVID funds. In January monitoring, we submitted two bids totaling 40.6 million. Funding these bids would provide certainty for next year and allow time to negotiate a more substantial future settlement. I've set out for you a number of significant and worrying developments that impact the my departments uh, more significantly than other departments coupled with the fact that the Northern Ireland economy will be in a difficult position in 2021-22 and will need more support and interventions than ever. I've written to the Minister of Finance detailing these concerns and copied that letter to executive colleagues. I am also aware that the Infrastructure Minister has flagged similar concerns. I would urge you to do whatever you can to support the Department's base for funding so that we can continue the vital work of assisting our businesses through this crisis and during the recovery phase. A successful economic recovery for Northern Ireland may well be the greatest challenge that we will all face in the next years. Um, can I say thank you um, and happy um, to continue the discussion. Okay, thank you, Minister, and I hope you can hear me okay. Um, <coughs> I, I think you have laid out some, some serious concerns there in relation to the budget going forward into next year, and I'm sure members will be wanting to pick up on some, some of that um, as we go on. And members have agreed to ask one question at a time, so we're trying to get around to everybody um, quite quickly this morning. I'm going to start with the, the support schemes, um, Minister, um, and we appreciate there is a, a lot going on within the department in terms of developing the schemes. and. A number of these have come on board um, recently as a result of funding allocations. I just want to start with the, the newly self-employed scheme um, and note that um, in the figures that we have got that 660 of them have been submitted so far and, and that, that is, is welcome. But we are aware that there are some people who are still excluded from that and I just wanted to get a little update from yourself in relation to, to, that partic to those particular concerns. Um, and if there are plans to extend that and then additionally the uh, supports for the company directors and the wet pubs and I know you mentioned them in your opening remarks um, and I think it's seen on social media yesterday that the wet pubs um, support scheme you plan to bring to the executive this week so I was just wondering if you could give a little bit more information in relation to those two schemes. Um, I don't know whether you can hear me very well. I probably got bits and pieces of that, um, Kiva, as opposed to at all. So forgive me if I if I am um, um, not on the right track. So um, you asked about the self-employed scheme, um, and I'm presuming it's really around the criteria for the self-employed scheme. So I'm, I'm going to just say some general opening remarks and I'll allow uh, Paul or Mike to come in um, as they uh, feel uh, the need to in relation to this. So the self-employed scheme uh, relates to those who um, were uh, 
unable to submit uh, a tax form in the year prior to that, but who became self-employed from uh, March uh, 2019. Um, those uh, self-employed scheme that we are currently operating and offering um, is pretty much the same self-employed scheme um, that we were asked um, to look at um, by those who were excluded um, and the same self-employed scheme that has been implemented in Wales and in Scotland. Um, and it's also the scheme that fits within the budget allocation that we've been given uh, from the Department of Finance. If we were to do anything different to this scheme, then it would essentially be a different scheme and would require further budget um, applications. Um, the information that we have so far from the scheme um, is that it, it's pretty much um, in terms of the number of applications at this moment in time, um, on, on a target um, to, to look at. Um, so we, we, yeah, it's pretty much on target. Um, we have around, we have indicated that this would apply to about two and a half thousand individuals. Um, and uh, currently the number of applications started with the scheme are around 1700. So it's pretty much on target for the cohort of individuals that the scheme is designed to address. Paul, do you want to come in? Um, I, well, the only thing I'd add, Minister, is that we're aware of um, exclusions. That was, um, you know, this, the, the scheme that's been delivered has a has a single purpose. So those people that um, weren't eligible for the SAIS, and it's the same criteria that's replicated. And, and as the minister explained, it's designed to fit that policy intent and the funding envelope that was allocated for it. Minister, I had just asked about the wet pubs and the um, company director schemes. Sorry, apologies. Of course, you got caught up with the self-employed scheme um, and didn't answer on the wet pubs. The wet pub scheme is pretty much ready to go. Um, it will um, hopefully um, go up to the executive for some discussion tomorrow. Um, if we look at those pubs, those traditional pubs, who do not serve food um, and that have been pretty much constantly closed um, from uh, March, except for the few weeks that they were allowed to open at the end of September, October. Um, those um, pubs have been given support through the localised restriction scheme run by the Minister of Finance from October on. They will continue to receive that support. So this scheme looks at the narrow period between the opening up of hospitality at the beginning of July and the um, opening up of the traditional pubs at the end of September and how you can support those businesses for that period um, that uh, they were closed and everybody else was open. Um, and it is mirrored on the localised restriction support scheme. So it, it's, it's, it's pretty much ready to uh, go. Um, and we were just doing some of the work around how we would verify uh, the scheme because it's important to get the scheme out, but it's also important um, to know that we are trying to manage money in a way that is verifiable um, for um, the future and just for the, 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 the use of public money. Uh, the company director scheme is still um, a little bit in the, um, the, the workings. We have sent an initial paper to the executive on this, um, but it does require some work around eligibility. So Paul may want to um, give you a fresh update on that. Uh, but the web pub scheme is, is pretty much ready to go, as is the large tourism and hospitality scheme, pretty much ready to go. Um, and we're hoping to get both of those out um, before Christmas. Company directors, Paul. Um, yeah, just to add to the minister, I think given the, 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 the nature of that population, it's quite a complex population to define. Um, I think there's something around 32,000 in total, um, so we need to find an eligibility criteria that, that um, targets those at need, um, 
uh, and it, it ensures that those eligible can apply. So we're we're engaging with stakeholders to ensure that the eligibility criteria meets the the policy intent that the ministers outlined. But the, the the broad framework of the scheme, as the minister said, is set, and we've shared that with executive colleagues. For that and just um, a quick follow-up. Sorry, um, Kiva, if I could just come in, sorry, just to say again that um, for the company director scheme, we had um, asked um, for a significant amount more than what we were actually allocated. So again, this scheme will have to fit within the budget that, that we are allocated. And I understand the constraints of that from local finance um, point of view, but also when you are designing a scheme particularly when there's a large population potentially um, that could engage with the scheme, um, you have to also then realise that we have a specific budget that was allocated to it um, and the scheme will have to live within the budget that was allocated. Thanks for that, Minister. And just a quick follow-up on the, the newly self-employed. Um, is it the intention to, to go back to the executive and to, to seek um, an amendment to that and further funding? Well, at the minute, I would like to see how the scheme develops and progresses. As I say, if there was to be um, amendments, or it would in fact probably require a new scheme, um, then that would uh, require a new budget. Um, that would require us to identify another cohort of people uh, within that, um, and so on. At this minute in time, I want to actually see how this scheme runs out, um, and then we do the evaluation. Uh, and so on from there. Um, but everything, of course, is dependent on the budget that's available um, and, and uh, how that's been allocated to us. Um, also, um, identifying that cohort of people um, is also important. Um, and so on. So at the minute, we're on track um, and the scheme looks as if it will broadly fulfil the policy objectives and meet the cohort of people that the policy objectives of the scheme is going to meet. Um, and as I say, and I do remind everyone that this is the same scheme that Scotland ran, it is the same scheme that Wales have run, and it is the scheme that the committee asked us to look at. Okay, thanks for that, Minister. I'm going to go on to members and I'll come back myself later. Um, Sinead? Okay, thank you, thank you Minister, um, uh, for your briefing this morning. Uh, can I um, probably move away just from some of the schemes uh, and uh, look at some of the issues around the transition? Uh, and could the, could the Minister give us uh, a rundown on how ready she believes that we are um, on the run up to the 31st of December. I know we got a paper today um, in relation to the protocol, but if she could uh, maybe articulate more in depth uh, in around the transition. Um, well, one of the things um, around this is, and um, in this, um, I know that the committee will have taken this view. I take the view, and in fact, actually, our wider stakeholders take the view. It's been incredibly difficult um, to help businesses to get ready when, in fact, um, there has been uh, agreements on some of these issues so late in the day. So, in fact, I, I think it's today that the Joint Committee is actually meeting to ratify the agreements that Michael Lowe spoke about in the House last week. Um, that will resolve some of our issues, but it doesn't resolve all of our issues and actually put some of, some of the uh, issues, uh, just pushes them down the road uh, a little bit. Um, so we broadly um, got um, to a better place on uh, NI to GB uh, transfer of goods. <coughs> we have um, managed uh, to avoid the hard stop in relation to export health certificates. Um, and the import of uh, goods into Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, on the issue of chilled meats, we've got a six month derogation. But remember, those are not terribly long amounts of time in which to seek proper solutions to all of the issues. Um, we would like to see greater clarity on a number of these issues, um, particularly around the Trusted Traders Scheme, 
who can be part of the trust, how it will work, um, and whether or not it's fair to um, individual businesses that will be bringing uh, goods in, um, as opposed to the large uh, supermarkets where so far much of the conversation has been around. So there's still issues to resolve on those big, higher level um, issues. And remember, of course, there is no derogation in any of this uh, around customs. So that's where the trader support service is absolutely vital. And it is absolutely vital that that is functioning and working uh, and that uh, government uh, have ensured that um, for the beginning of the year. Um, so higher level agreements help us and take us forward um, around all of those things. Um, in the meantime, we as a department have been um, working with businesses um, and invest in I have been working with businesses in Intertrade Ireland, as we discussed yesterday in the assembly, have been working with those smaller <coughs> SMEs in order to help them prepare. And if you look at the Invest NI timeline just for this week or for last week, you will see how many uh, webinars, how much advice, etc., was given out to businesses on all of these issues. Um, and therefore, there is the online uh, exit, EU exit resilience to the Brexit preparation grants, and all of this um, has have been working uh, with uh, our businesses in Northern Ireland. But as I say, this is a very complex issue um, and the lateness of the uh, agreements around this um, have, have hampered um, businesses. I must also say that many businesses here, common across the world, I would say, um, have been so focused on trying to combat the impact of COVID um, and Brexit has been uh, difficult to take on board for them as well. Uh, that has been entirely a complicated factor on the matter. Um, the other thing that will really help businesses enormously, <coughs> sorry, it's terrible heat in this room. Um, the other thing that will help businesses enormously, of course, is a free trade agreement. And I have said repeatedly that an outcome that gives us a zero tariff, zero quota free trade uh, agreement would be an enormous help um, to us in Northern Ireland. Mike, do you want to come in on those issues? Yeah, so as Minister said, uh, investment, trade investment, all that time and resources in terms of trying to get the business community ready for the end of the transition period. Um, but you know, the big unknown is whether there will be a trade agreement in place or not. So while you know, businesses struggle with that fundamental question, and uh, you can see my business operation rates in the last few years, right? Mike, can you speak up a bit? Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Better, yeah. yeah. Okay, no, I was just making the point that, um, as the Minister said, invest, and I and the trade have invested a lot of time and resource into trying to uh, increase business preparedness. But well, the fundamental question um, remains unresolved, and that question is um, whether there will be a free trade agreement or not in place. Um, you can see why business has been constrained, um, and also you know, uh, the uncertainty around customs is probably the most profound question that they have to address, and yet that's the one that remains unanswered. Just as a, a follow-up as well, um, Minister, in relation to preparedness again, um, there's a lot of legislation that will be required um, to be passed. Mm -hmm. Have you got any idea what the timetable of that is going to be in relation to uh, between now and the 31st of December? I suppose um, I'm asking you, are you a fortune teller? But, um, <laughs> but you know, it, it, it's important that we kind of know what's ahead of us as well. You know, we have to prepare for a deal and a no deal. Uh, and I just wonder where the department is with that preparation. Okay, so um, obviously this department um, has a significant um, range of legislative uh, amendments that have to be advanced. Um, they are probably most exposed across any departments and then ourselves. So what we've been able to do over recent weeks is triaging um, the legislative requirements. Um, and what we've been doing is focusing on what we need to have in place for day one. 
And uh, I think we're pretty confident now that um, we have uh, covered what we need to to address day one pressures in terms of legislative cover. Um, and they mainly by in the, the, the energy area. And we think that we have a um, suite of um, uh, legislation in place that will take to you guys and um, cover on day one. There does, however, remain a significant portfolio of legislation that has to be progressed pretty urgently um, through January, February time. However, some of that will be dependent on the outcome of the UK, EU, and the nature of the agreement that's put in place. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, can I just ask very quickly, there's, um, I think in the, the, the table we have, there's five SRs that were supposed to be passed by the end of the year, and um, one in particular in relation to energy interoperability um, that is um, quite significant, and it says that the department can't quantify the potential damage that failure to legislate will cause. Can you maybe just elaborate a little bit on that? I'm not sure, sure, but I think you're referring to the single electricity market comparability. Is that the legislation you're referring to? Yeah, let me just open it up here. Um, it's the one in black one. Um, Print's very small. Yeah. What number is it? It's, it's on the dashboard. We can come back to it. Sure. <laughs> We, we can come back to it, Mike, when I, when I find it in my, my pack. So I go on to um, John O'Dowd. Can we bring John into the spotlight, please? Um, uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Minister, for your, for your presentation. Uh, Minister, I want to just uh, move in relation to a COVID-related matter, but this time in relation to our student population. Several weeks ago in the chamber, I asked you about the Scottish Executive's initiative uh, in releasing £1.3 million pounds for the health and well-being of students. Uh, and you, in fairness to you, you gave a very positive response to it. It's something that you were interested in. Uh, I then later put a similar question to the Health Minister, and he again w w was positive in his response. I'm just wondering, has there been an opportunity for a meeting between your two departments, uh, and has that matter been progressed? The two departments, John, and I know this is an issue that you are genuinely interested in, and so am I, because I think that COVID has had um, probably as yet an unknown, but I, I'm thinking fairly devastating impact on mental health and well-being right across the community. And um, um, just as an aside, you know, I was out in the constituency at the weekend talking to some business people. Um, and the, the, the mood and I mean, the level of anxiety, if I can put it that way, um, is very, very high um, among that population of people as well. So I think COVID has had a pretty devastating impact um, on mental health and well-being. Um, so the department uh, mainly engages with the Department of Health through the, the coordinating role of TEO around students. So we'll be looking at students in the travel home, students um, and on, on a range of issues and on the restart um, for uh, university uh, in the new year and working with the universities on that. You know that um, in the past financial year, um, I have uh, been formally and in fact doubled over five million the amount of money that has been available for student hardship and to alleviate uh, that student hardship. We have kept an eye on that level of funding um, and it is still adequate for this financial year, but I will not hesitate to look for further funding um, if we need it to add uh, to that um, for uh, hardship. Um, so therefore, um, the issue of hardship um, as being one of those factors that impacts on student mental health um, is being addressed. And if I need to, I will continue to address this because I do think it is really, really important. And many of those students, my own uh, family included, find work in hospitality and so on to augment 
um, their student grant work that they just simply have not had over the last number of, of uh, months. So the issue of hardship, um, I think, is being addressed. But if there is a specific need, um, I will, of course, uh, look at that. And I think within that is the issue of uh, well-being, which uh, the universities um, are also uh, addressing. And I know that Queen's University and Ulster have been doing specific work around that. Um, if there are specific issues um, that uh, you think that we can do more um, with the student population uh, and with the university, of course, I'm happy to have a separate conversation and talk to you about it because I do think it is one of the most important issues we'll address. Michael, yeah. you want to come in as well? Just, just to add that, Minister, there are um, a couple of other issues that relate directly to students in COVID. Um, so, for example, an um, additional funding requirement for uh, free meals for students, particularly in the education sector, yeah. um, and also for rapid access to testing of students. So there are discussions on the way with the Department of Finance, and indeed the papers going to the executive funds in Marvel that adjust that position. So they remain in the context of both uh, India and January monitoring minutes, and also uh, requests to the executive for the 21 23 budget position. So without um, getting into the details, you know, there are additional allocations that we saw, and we're getting some encouraging signals back that those student pressures will be addressed. Sorry, John, just as well as that, I will um, drop you a note um, which outlines all of this, but also which would outline the uh, level of funding that we've uh, given uh, to try to help students get online and improve their online access and access to laptops, etc. Just a follow up, Dutcher, I, I appreciate it. And there has been additional funding provided to students. But what, one of the concerns I have is this. There's a considerable amount of funding left in the university's hardship funds, which doesn't reflect the amount of correspondence I and other elected representatives receive around the hardship students are facing. So I think there is a question of accessibility and the criteria universities are using to access those funds. I think it's too stringent. And considering it is public funds, it has been provided by your department. I think, Minister, there is an opportunity for your department to engage with the universities to ensure that their criteria is flexible, accessible, and meeting the needs of students today. Because where there is public money available and it's not being spent, then it's a waste. It's a wasted opportunity. Uh, so I, I would ask you to follow up on that matter if you want, please. Uh, Michael, uh, are you I mean, we do want to target the students with the criteria that are most in need. So that, that is a really important issue for me, that we are really targeting those who are most in need. Those, um, you know, and, and there are a range of students uh, with a, a, a range of needs, including the students with disabilities um, and students with family commitments. Um, but it's very important that we are targeting those most in need. I know that there was some relaxation in relation to the COVID issues that students were experiencing, but I will um, look at that and will ask the um, universities to reflect that uh, and come back to me. And when they do, I will write you. Thank you. Just to say, I, I'll be talking to the universities on Friday, the Vice Chancellor, and talking to the Chancellor of Queen's University just last Friday, so I can raise that specific concern just to make sure that there's not a problem in terms of eligibility criteria. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mike. And if I just go back then briefly to that question around the SRs, it's in the, the minister's letter, and it says one concern in energy and inoperability is potentially resulting from the as yet unknown outcome of the negotiations will not be in place by the end of the year. And then it's in um, the list of, leg of statutory rules. It's number six, and says legislation um, may be required to deal with any inoperabilities um, in retained EU law once the scope of the protocol um, has been determined. Um, so just wanting to <coughs> understand what kind of contingencies are in place in terms for needing to put those SRs in place. Sure, so if I pick you up rightly, you're asking what the status is in SR6, is, is that correct? Yes, yes. Right, uh, I, I do think that then is directly tied into the nature 
nature of the negotiations. But what I will do is we will we'll write to you later today just to get the background. Not that I think the problem with that is you need to know if there's no, no deal, is there going to be some sort of informal uh, operability of energy systems um, in early January? But I'll double check and get back to you writing on that. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, Gary, can we bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Is that what's up, Kevin? I said he sounds like a washing Thanks, machine. Chair. Uh, you can hear me okay. Uh, my question, Minister, is just around you gave a brief um, picture in terms of the budget. Outlook, obviously, we're not too far away from uh, the start of the uh, 2021 uh, budget period. Uh, could you maybe give us an idea in terms of the pressures which are going to exist, but also some of the priorities that you will want to see financed to get into the next year? And obviously, you did mention the fact that you'll be prioritising recovery, which is, which is absolutely the right thing to do. But how vital is it that you get the necessary support uh, to ensure that we can do all the things that we need to do to get our economy back to the level that we need it to be at. And one of the most important issues that we can work on together over the next number of months. Um, I am choosing to be uh, more hopeful, even in the midst of very difficult circumstances. Um, I think that with the vaccine uh, rollout, which um, is excellent to see um, across Northern Ireland, um, with the vaccine rollout, that we can lead our economy and our society back to more normal times. So I am choosing uh, today um, and to, to, to be more hopeful, and I think that um, that is something that we should all cling on to. However, there are specific things that we will need to do um, that are around economic recovery. And this department will need the tools and the funding in order to be able to achieve that economic recovery. As it um, sits at this minute in time, and I'll ask Mike to come in on this as well, we currently have pressures within the budget of around 54 million. That is within the recurrent budget. That is COVID tails of 34 million. That um, relates to um, the, the apprenticeship schemes that we want to continue to run, etc. Um, and the, it, uh, is around the other uh, budgetary pressures. We also then have pressures around our European funding. Um, and again, around 45 million around ERDF, ESF, and 25 around Erasmus and uh, competitive funding. All in all, that gives us budget pressures as we start the year of around 124 million. If we were to apply those budget pressures, that would lead us to a 15% cut in the Department of the Economy budget. Now, obviously, that's an enormous cut um, to budgets at a time when uh, there are an enormous potential cut, sorry, potential cut, um, at a time when uh, the executive and this department has to prioritise economic recovery and the additional funds that we will uh, need for that. So I'm just talking about the baseline uh, budget in relation to that. We have um, already written out to the department's arms out bodies and asked them at an initial uh, start of this um, how they would cope with budget cuts of around 4% or 8%. Um, and we are waiting on those responses filtering back um, into the, the department. We have also, um, when um, we were looking at the spending review, um, and looking at the three-year budget plan, which has now become obviously a one-year budget plan, um, uh, we were looking for additional funding for around 50 million per annum, um, which would help us to develop an economic recovery fund. And that's essentially um, important because we need to support business um, and innovation um, going forward. So that's the position broadly of the department. I'll ask Mike or Paul to come in um, in relation to those figures um, or anything else that they want to 
But the important thing is that we enter this period of budget negotiation, um, that there are incredible pressures on the baseline budget of the department, never name the additional funding that we will require if we are to instigate economic recovery measures. And I think that that is hugely important. The last thing I want to say about in relation to the budget, and I think this is huge again, is the idea um, 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 that we need um, to future proof our economy by investing in skills. And we need that additional skills budget, which will help us to provide um, our people with the skills that they need to lead the future economy of Northern Ireland. Um, and in the right places and in the right um, areas for skills. And I do hope that I have the committee's support in seeing that those additional funds in economic recovery, in skills, and in uh, protecting the baseline budgets of the department um, so that we can get on ahead and do the things that we need to do. I'm going to ask Mike specifically to address the issue of um, Invest in I um, and its innovation budget um, because that is an immediate and top priority. Okay, thanks, Minister. Um, as the Minister said, the, the budget position is incredibly challenging, and not just for this department, it be incredibly challenging for uh, all departments in the, in the executive. Um, just to give you an insight into the scale of the challenge, if we step back and look at the Chancellor's statement of Thursday last week. Um, the outcome for Northern Ireland um, is essentially a, a, a best of flat cash settlement across the MA block. And when you consider that the uh, health department health accounts for about 55% of that, that Northern Ireland block, and the health inflation is running in something like 6%, you can see then the simple mathematics of the challenge that they rise ahead for the remaining departments um, in the NICS. So, I, I, there will be both a nominal and a real terms cut that have to be made. It helps the fact that there will have to be a nominal and a real terms cut on the other departments. The Minister said about the challenges for this department. At the minute, we have a, a cash settlement somewhere in the order of 820 million pounds. And the Minister has detailed that we have inescapable pressures of somewhere in the order of 125 million pounds. And that covers the normal inescapable pressures. Um, but more importantly, um, the lack of uh, continuation of EU funding going forward and the fact that the shared prosperity fund um, will not sort of replicate on a time to time basis what was coming in from the EU funds. That's a major concern, particularly for this department, probably more so than any other department because of the reliance both in ESF and ERDF for things like R&D, innovation, and friendships. So that's a profound policy challenge for this department to have to address. And what that will mean is, um, because the likes of SNI and um, right business well in advance of the financial year, and because their reliance on EU funding um, will diminish very significantly, if not completely, and that the Treasury will cover what's called EU funding deals in the future years. Um, I suspect we're in a position now, when I was talking to the investment and I board earlier this morning, and I made this point to them. I think the best and I, for example, are in a position now where they will have to stop writing new business going forward because they don't have budget cover. As the Minister said uh, a few weeks ago, um, I wrote out to uh, the Department of the Arms Link Bodies, the universities, the MBA colleges, and best and I, asking them to give their projections of what a 4% and an 8% budget cut would mean for the department. The more I've looked into the numbers since then, I think um, I, should have, I should have gone for more draconian scenarios. I think um, 8% isn't the worst case scenario, um, depending on how the budget negotiations go. The fundamental point here is um, if, if, if everyone is genuine about the need to invest in economic recovery going forward, you have to resource that. It's not just going to be met by warm words. Um, as the minister said, you know, we had plans for a fund somewhere in the order of 50 million pounds per annum just to try and address economic recovery. That would have been an addition to our flat line, flat cash budget position, not a, a, an 8% cut or something worse than that. I'll just I'll pause there. Um, can I just add, though, that in terms of the EU funding piece of this, 
we are not on our own. We are in a common position with all of the other regions across the United Kingdom. So that um, when I talk to my counterparts in Scotland, Wales, um, and indeed uh, individual MPs across probably the north of England, um, they are, their regions um, are in exactly the same position. Now, I, I know that the executive, the finance minister and I have all been working um, with uh, national government to try to rectify this position. Um, and I, I would hope that we would um, get some play in rectifying the position. But I just want to outline for the, the committee the seriousness of the situation, the need for support in ensuring that we get the appropriate budget um, allocation, um, and indeed the need uh, for recovery funding um, as well. It's a huge issue going forward. We cannot take this economy into a new place if we are not uh, funding it. As Mike says, warm words won't really do it. Um, and we do need uh, to provide uh, the funding uh, and will give leadership to the economy uh, and confidence to businesses to go forward. Thank you for that, uh, Minister, and thanks, Mike, for uh, those contributions. I think you've outlined very clearly the serious situation that we are uh, facing as we go into next year. And I think that as a committee, it is important that whilst we will do inquiries and it's important work, we need to ensure that we lend our support as well to ensure that the, the finance and the resources that you require to do the initiative that you want to do uh, that it's there for you. So as a committee, I think it's important that we uh, do all we can in the, the coming months to ensure you get the necessary resource. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Minister, for, for joining us this morning. And indeed, a word of thanks to you and your officials for, in the last couple of weeks, um, engaging with representatives from excluded NI again uh, to help you refine the schemes which you've just been rolling out. Uh, that has been very helpful. Um, but the reality is we could have done this a very long time ago, uh, and you have, in fact, spent most of the year thrashing around in the dark, uh, trying to work out who to support uh, and how to do that. But, Minister, today there are still people who are remain excluded. So can I ask you what actions you intend to take to mop up those areas that are still excluded, and also what action you intend to take to provide a, a fast, quick uh, appeals mechanism. We're getting a lot of people coming to us um, who are in the, the, the LRSS scheme who are saying um, that they're not being that they are not um, getting funding yet, you know, a neighbouring business or somebody else who's in virtually identical circumstances to themselves are uh, and they just, just they find it very very difficult to understand why they're not getting support at this point in time so can i make an appeal to you to get a very quick appeals mechanism up there or at least a way for people to get answers to their questions that could have been and should have been best served by a hotline or inquiry line um, again too little too late minister but uh, we, we learn by the lessons of all of these things um, I, I, and just very briefly, taking us into the future, uh, and I'll roll two questions into one here, Chair. Just taking us into the future, Minister, where do you see us uh, in the next financial year? Uh, while we still have to balance health against economy, um, I was listening to the, to the former Governor of the Bank of England this morning, who, who made it clear that governments will have difficult decisions to make in the next uh, financial period as they balance health versus economy, and that they will have to take the brutal decisions that there will be some businesses which quite simply are not going to survive this and will have to be left behind because they are currently uh, pleading for support. Um, so, um, first of all, Stuart, uh, thank you for the questions in your own inimitable style. Um, can I also say that I haven't been thrashing around in the dark about anything. I can only deal with the schemes uh, that I'm asked to bring forward by the uh, executive and when the funding for those schemes has been provided by the executive and the finance minister. And hence, we are doing what we are doing at this moment in time. Um, Invest NI has a helpline for the COVID restrictions business support scheme. 
Um, I have talked to many of my constituents and they find the helpline to be very um, efficient uh, in trying to work through the problems uh, that they have. Um, and I'm glad to say that um, we are well on targeting on target uh, to actually uh, paying um, particularly Part A of the scheme um, out uh, before Christmas. The, of course, the local uh, restriction support scheme is a Department of Finance scheme. So if you want um, to uh, address your questions to the Finance Minister in relation to either an appeals mechanism, a helpline or anything else, then uh, you should feel free to do so. Um, and that's um, equally uh, important to say. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on the schemes that this department runs, and I'm happy to take responsibility for them. That's my job, but um, I would direct you um, to the Department of Finance in relation to your query around appeals, um, helpline, etc. Um, I would also, um, in mitigation, say, that um, unless you've been involved in devising schemes um, that have to be done quickly um, and uh, with the best protections that you can around public money, these are extremely difficult things to do. Um, and um, my department in particular, which has been responsible uh, for handling so much uh, of the schemes, and indeed um, up until the recent schemes, we. We are actually proud to say that we have over we have helped over thirty two thousand businesses in Northern Ireland. Businesses that might not have been here if they had not received the help that they have received. And we will continue to engage with businesses to, to make sure that we are looking at uh, what might be the gaps in the funding and how best we can address them. Um, so it's important uh, to get those. Uh, uh, facts straight, and it's also important, Stuart, to direct your queries to the appropriate department. Um, can I also say where do I see the economy uh, as being um, in the next year? I think the next, the start of this year, will continue to be extremely challenging and extremely difficult. Um, and I, I don't say that in any light way at all. I say that with a heavy heart, knowing the impact on businesses having talked to many businesses uh, across Northern Ireland. However, I am hopeful that with the rollout of the vaccine, that we will um, start to see a pickup. And I noticed actually um, the Ulster Bank survey, which was um, uh, sent out this week, which says that for the first time in many, many months, that business uh, confidence was higher uh, and, in, and more positive than it had been for a significant period of time. That there were still very significant challenges, but that actually businesses um, were more confident about the future. And that's uh, important to note um, as well. Um, we will continue um, to work to support businesses in the impact of COVID, but we also are going to continue to plan for that new economy for Northern Ireland. And still, the four tenets of um, that that we uh, looked at in the rebuilding a stronger economy are still relevant, are still there, and we will continue to work on those. We'll also continue to work uh, with the agri food sector, and I hope to announce some um, uh, further work around agri food um, in the very near future. We will continue to work um, around uh, clean energy. Not just about the sustainability of the environment, but also about how it can produce prosperity and jobs in Northern Ireland. We will continue to support the digital sector and those uh, startups from that sector. We will continue and hope to roll out uh, the programme of city deals um, throughout Northern Ireland, which I think are exciting um, development uh, for the economy and part of our medium term uh, recovery plan. And of course, it was also really good um, this morning. I was listening to the news um, and I heard um, the CEO of Tourism Ireland um, indicating that from their research, actually, people were looking forward to travelling um, and perhaps around the summer um, of uh, this year. And we want to get those marketing campaigns right, particularly in the Republic of Ireland, in uh, the GB, and indeed with our international operators so that we can once again welcome people back 
to Northern Ireland, and also looking forward to the opening um, and the tourism context of the new game of Thrones facility um, for Northern Ireland. I think that is another piece of the product jigsaw that we need uh, to build to attract tourism in Northern Ireland. So while we have certain difficulties and challenges, and we will continue to work from that, I think that we have very, very good long-term prospects, um, and we will also work and focus in on them. But I'm going back to my budget um, work. We need the ability to do that and the appropriate finances to do that. Minister, given, given, that, given that most businesses don't understand the difference between your department and the Department of Finance, and that two departments operate different schemes, are you not actually a bit ashamed of sitting in your bunker and silo? Assembly and members should the understand the difference between could, two departments. Could you and the Finance Minister not get yourselves together and have put together a common programme which would have delivered uh, the answers to the questions to, to businesses for both departments? And I would put exactly the same question to the Finance Minister. As well. Oh, I haven't heard you do that. Uh, I would have to say that I, I understand why, uh, when members confuse schemes, how the general public will also confuse schemes. I am very proud of the work that this department has done. We have risen to the challenge of uh, helping businesses in the most dire and unprecedented of circumstances. And we will continue to work faithfully with businesses and with the wider business organisations to address the challenges that they meet. All I ask is that members address their questions appropriately. That way, the general public will not be confused either. Thank you, Minister. Um, Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, Minister Mike and Paul, for your contribution. I think we all genuinely recognise the amount of money that has been put out in grants and support to businesses. And small businesses and large businesses have all got access to it. And those of us that are proactive in our constituencies will be very much aware of that. And um, yes, there's been problems, but a lot of work has been done. And I think it's put, important we put that on the record. The Department of Economy, Department of Finance and the various agencies have worked continuously right through from February March right through this whole year, delivering support for businesses, which has been unprecedented, that support. And I understand what, with 300 odd million, Minister, maybe you could clarify the latest position, but the amount of money has been unprecedented. And in the main, it's been very much appreciated by those businesses that got it during their time of need. My point just is on tourism. How do we get tourism fired up in the new year, the spring, the summer? We're looking forward to it. Um, what sort of initiatives have you in, in, in train to, to try and stimulate growth and trying to get our airports and so on back in business? Can we get some information on that, please, Minister? Thank you. Um, so, I, I, and thank you um, for your comments around uh, the issues of support for businesses. It is very important to me. Um, and I spend a significant amount of my time talking to the wider business community um, and to business organisations as to how we can best support businesses, not just in response to COVID, but in uh, our economic recovery. And that's uh, incredibly important to me. But it's more important to families across Northern Ireland where we can retain jobs um, and uh, boost uh, the economy and people's own standard of living. So tourism, um, again, um, I don't think we can ever underestimate how difficult it has been uh, for tourism and indeed the wider hospitality um, industry over the past year. They have suffered repeated lockdowns, um, measures that are required to keep people safe within uh, their uh, businesses. And it has been incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, we now have um, a, a, a new campaign from Tourism Ireland um, about renewing, restarting, redesigning, and rebuilding tourism. And I look forward to engaging with that. Um, in the, uh, the past year, we uh, spent uh, around 700,000. Uh, pounds in uh, a marketing campaign in GB, run by Tourism Ireland, 
uh, under the Embrace the Giant Spirit logo, um, uh, specific to Northern Ireland and attracting visitors from GB. And again, uh, when we look at all of the information that Tourism Ireland has, uh, we will be in our first um, start or impetus to tourism um, from uh, either the GB or the ROI market. So it's really important that we are able to resource um, both Tourism uh, NI and uh, Tourism Ireland to work in those markets initially and then to go out um, to the broader markets um, to encourage tourists here. Again, I was encouraged uh, by uh, the research, the findings of the research, where um, it's always indicated that we're a friendly people, that people feel comfortable coming uh, to be amongst us, and that particularly the North American market are keen to get back to traveling uh, to Northern Ireland. And I look forward to those days. And I actually look forward as well to being able to uh, go back out um, and visit uh, these uh, destinations and encourage people to come to Northern Ireland. We also have um, initiatives that are ongoing uh, around tourism. So we will uh, have the, the voucher scheme. Um, we have had some initiatives around helping tourism businesses uh, to reboot um, and to look at the needs that they particularly have. Um, and those are extremely important um, in helping uh, tourism going forward. Um, some uh, folk yesterday in the chamber talked about events tourism. And events tourism is really, really important um, in not just having the event and the, 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 the flow from the event, but many of these event, events uh, lead legacies uh, within Northern Ireland. And I'm really looking forward to getting out again and, and engaging and seeing whether we can um, bring back uh, some of the big events to Northern Ireland. Again, um, sound a bit like a broken record this morning, but events tourism is, is, a, is brilliant to do, but requires significant budget uh, in order to do it. And also I think that Northern Ireland's centenary is a year uh, in which we can encourage people to come uh, to uh, see the progress of Northern Ireland, and to really see how uh, Northern Ireland has grown, developed, uh, and moved on, um, and we want uh, to encourage people to come to Northern Ireland. Uh, okay, just uh, a couple of points briefly. I think uh, we dropped out. She, no, no, I think we're still live. Still live. Just a couple of points, just on the uh, hospitality, the hotel sector, which we have lobbied on for some time. I understand there's support pending for them. Is that the case, and will it be coming through very soon? And just on the event tourism, I think we'd fully support that. We're all very much aware of the the, the Open Golf Championship that was such a great success in, in North Antrim. And um, I'm sure you're aware as well, Minister, I know you are, about the, the bid for the World Rally Championship next year, which is hopefully will be on your table very soon. And I hope you keep progressing that and find the appropriate money for it. But uh, there is a great spin-off from all these events, and I think it's important that we, we keep that to the forward event tourism and, and the impact it can have. So uh, the, the answer to your first question around the large uh, tourism and hospitality scheme, that scheme is pretty much ready to go. Um, and we will be bringing it to the executive uh, very soon. We've engaged extensively um, with the stakeholders in relation to that, and this really applies to very large uh, tourism and hospitality businesses um, that um, have were not able to access the tail or the 25k, i.e., have an NAV of uh, 51,000 uh, plus. Um, so that is pretty much ready to go and will um, be um, offered reasonably soon. Um, the issue around events tourism. Events tourism, as you know, is one of the things that um, has given Northern Ireland a high profile of tourism. It was brilliant to actually walk to Galgorm and the Irish Open um, and to hear how people, even in the most difficult of circumstances, delivered uh, a really great uh, golf tournament. 
and how much better it would have been were we able um, to have had uh, spectators of that. Um, so, but events tourism is all dependent on the budget that is available for that tourism. Um, and again, um, I would seek your support um, in uh, having a distinct events tourism budget. Great, thanks very much, Minister. Thank you, thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, the Minister is uh, too much of a professional to rise debating, uh, but I'm not. Um, I find it incredible that a member of the Economy Committee would sit in this committee and use the phrase, some businesses will have to be left behind. I'm sorry, I just don't think that that's our function as a committee. I think our job is to be supporting businesses, and the only reason why these schemes are in place and why businesses are in the trouble that they're in is because of political decisions that have been made here on the Hill. Uh, can I ask the Minister what the cost of lockdown has been to the economy thus far? I, I, well, you, you will know that we have published uh, several papers and indeed we had a discussion at our um, leadership group in the department yesterday um, around the publication uh, of further evidence around the cost of lockdown. Look, um, I'm going to ask Mike um, to explain this um, and go through it, but we all know that we um, have to keep people safe um, and that we are in the middle of a health pandemic. But you also know that my very firm view is that the best way to progress our economy is to have our economy open and safely working uh, again as best we can. I accept that there are very challenging times ahead, um, but again, I am uh, choosing to be hopeful in that I think with the rollout of the vaccine um, that we can uh, recover lost ground, particularly around tourism and hospitality uh, and for many businesses, and we will continue to support them to do so. Mike, the floor is yours. Okay, so thanks, Mr. Um, so the Minister made reference to some of the research material that the economy department has published over recent weeks and months. And in all cases, um, a picture on the same campus, and it, it doesn't look good, which is why we need to focus on the importance and prioritization of economic recovery. If I could just make reference to one piece of research that we published um, recently, which was by um, the Fraser Allender Institute in, in Scotland, and it highlighted that Northern Ireland suffered more than any other UK as a consequence of the economic downturn in COVID. And some of the key metrics, um, you're probably all well aware of them, the employment rate has fallen, the unemployment rate has increased, the inactivity rate, particularly amongst young people, has increased, the composite economic indicator for Northern Ireland fell by 13.6%, which is actually it's now down to its lowest level ever. Okay. We know that there's 54,000 employees still furloughed in Northern Ireland, and we know that there's 70,000 people self-employed self individuals in Northern Ireland now on the second grant support scheme. Okay, so you bring all those metrics together, and that shows you a perilous state the global economy is in, and it shows you how much ground has been lost. You know, a lot of the labour market improvements, for example made over the last six or seven years have all been lost in the last six or seven months. So when we talk about budgets and policies around economic recovery, we need to take all those metrics on board to real, realise how much ground we have to make, make up and the need to prioritise interventions to address that. And that's why um, and some of those, including some people um, sitting around this table who advocate for continuing with keeping the economy in lockdown in the coming months will be coming banging on the minister's door, accusing her of not taking enough action to protect jobs. So I think they can't, they, the Janice-faced approach that there has been from some people in relation to these issues is really quite something. Can I ask, I've seen that there was a paper published recently in relation to the assessment of likely job losses when the furlough schemes come to an end. I think was the figure somewhere between 45 and 100,000 people likely to lose their jobs. And I'm just wondering, have you? is it simply a median? Do you just put it in the middle and we're looking at potentially 75,000 job losses in Northern Ireland? Yeah, that, 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 that
Well, that's one possible scenario, but it depends on a number of variables that are uncertain. So, for example, um, the degree to which the local economy remains locked down in the first quarter of next year. As I said, you know, we have um, 450,000 still on furlough. The furlough scheme ends at the end of March, and you have 70,000 self employed individuals on some form of grant scheme. If you get to the end of March and the economy is still in significant degrees of lockdown, then you can see that the impact on the labour market will not be good. And that's why it's really disappointing as soon as freedoms are announced and people are told that they're going to have a, a more relaxed situation, you have a government minister jumping up the following day to say that further lockdowns in the new year are, in his words, inevitable. Um, can I ask, since this started, how much money in total has the Department for the Economy bid for and how much has it received? Total bits. All may be closer to total bits, but I know that we've spent some in the order, or just on, on grant schemes in the convention, some in the order of just over 400 million. I suspect, I think we've bid, I think we've outstanding bids left, somewhere about 150 million, but Paul may have to, so that would suggest we, in gross terms, bid for something around about 550 million, but Paul may have greater insight. Thank you. Um, can we bring in Claire, please? Can we bring Claire into the spotlight? Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, Minister. Um, Minister, uh, I suppose this follows on somewhat to comments by Mr. Stafford. If we are anticipating um, uh, any further lockdowns or restrictions in the new year, um, where are you moving towards uh, businesses advising you in the best way to do that? Because, you know, I, I do rec I, I met with a number of businesses in my own constituency last week and was quite impressed by some of the, the safety measures that they had put in place. And indeed, any of the recent lockdowns or restrictions that we've seen doesn't necessarily seem to be working. So is there more of a strategic plan um, in, uh, in shutting down particular businesses? And, you know, what... What can we look for, or what what can we see in the new year around that, and and how are you being advised, you know, uh, to to see all the various businesses and what they're doing and what they can do to to get infection. Well, you raise an absolutely excellent uh, point, and um, and one uh, which um, I raise uh, on a, a frequent and regular basis with my executive colleagues. Um, I think that the issue, and I am not the expert, Claire, on the transmission of the virus. I am not the expert. Um, but from what I see and, and the conversations we have had, is that um, even though we have uh, reduced business activity and closed a number of businesses over the last number uh, of weeks, yet we still have um, either a plateauing or and now an upward trajectory. Um, in the transmission of the virus. So something is not working in relation to all of that. Um, and like you, um, at times I have been uh, bewildered, uh, annoyed and stressed out by the fact that many businesses um, take uh, enormous steps uh, to try to ensure the safety uh, of their customers uh, and their employees yet those businesses are targeted uh, on a regular basis uh, for closure. And I think that um, there are issues around for us all, and I speak to myself as well, and those are issues around personal responsibility. Those are the issues around simple advice that we can all take and all do around masks, space, around washing our hands. Those personal responsibility issues um, that we need to take. Um, and there are also the issues around compliance, which I think, and messaging, which I think um, have hit a, a very, very difficult space. Um, and hence, then uh, we resort um, to uh, the closure of the economy. You know my view on this, that uh, opening and closing the economy in the cycle of lockdowns is very damaging for the Northern Ireland economy, is damaging for the prospects uh, of businesses um, and damaging uh, for individuals and their families. Um, but we have got to balance the health implications as well. There are no easy answers. There are literally no easy answers. Um, and I have seen um, my colleagues um, uh, angst and, and anger and, and frustration uh, over uh, the current situation. 
As I said today, I'm choosing to be in a more hopeful phase. And I think that with the rollout of the vaccine, um, we can get the economy back on track, um, as well as supporting businesses through the uh, thank you, Minister. And I, I suppose just to pick up on the point around messaging and compliance, um, in my experience certainly on the, in the constituency, I think most people want to comply whether they agree with the restrictions or not. But I think the difficulty that they're having is knowing what they need to comply with. Because I think the messaging has been quite thorough around this. Um, I think people are confused. You know, like I, I'm dealing with this day, on a daily basis. And to an extent, I'm not even sure what the restrictions are. So if I can offer any going forward, we need to make it clear for the people that it matters to. Um, you know, putting it into regulations is not for Joe Public in the sense that they don't know how to in interpret or read legislation. NI Direct hasn't been great either, and it doesn't deal with the significant variance that people will certainly ask, and certainly as MLAs on the ground were experiences. And I don't necessarily expect you to tick every box, but but I think there does have to be some sort of uh, connection with people on the ground to understand what questions they're asking and I'm not quite sure that's happening and I think that's where we've had an issue with compliance. Yeah, I, I, well, I haven't made some of these points at the general executive meetings um, that I think messaging um, will help greater compliance and people understand like, why they're being asked to do something um, and do it in a particular way. I also think that we all also have to um, exercise personal responsibility. I don't think that we can escape that, um, and, and everyone uh, cannot escape that as well. I mean, it, I, I'm happy to take these general messages uh, again, Claire, to the executive and to the information service of the executive. And if you want to drop me a note, start me in advance of tomorrow's executive. Very, very happy to do that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Minister. Um, Minister, just a couple of members want to come back in, but could I just ask a, a brief question? Um, the the two uh, CRBSS schemes are due to close um, this evening, and um, I was just wondering if you think that the uptake for Part B in particular has been a little lower than you would expect, and if there's any consideration to um, potentially extending that deadline. I find that extremely difficult to hear. Um, Paul, do you maybe want to come in if you've got that clear? Um, and I think the question was about the, the deadline of the, of the, the schemes, and particularly about Part B, and whether they're sort of close to 400 um, is a number that we were expecting. Is that? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, um, in, in relation to Part B of the scheme, actually, uh, one of the things that I had asked the best NI to do a couple of weeks ago was to go back out and cite individual examples so that we could help people to understand more clearly the target group uh, for the scheme. But uh, again, um, we will be happy uh, to look at that. Paul, you have a specific date in relation to closure. I'm sorry, I, I see that broken down in the hearing people. I can hear you. It's due to close this evening. So we're just asking if there's any potential for looking at extending that deadline. There certainly is the potential to extend it, um, and, and we can have a conversation around that. Um, I think probably as well, um, we, we need to look at what further executive decisions are um, in the near future. You know, okay, thanks for that. Um, Minister, I know you're due to leave us shortly, but we have two members looking back in, if you, if you have a few minutes. Yes, so it's fine. It's, it's all of a sudden this number, the connection's very poor. No, there was a momentary flip on a chair. Hopefully it's corrected itself. Okay. Uh, we're hoping that it is corrected. Um, can we bring John O'Dowd in the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you. Just a quick question, Minister. The Education Minister, yesterday, as you'll be aware, uh, announced changes he's making to A-levels and AESs in response to the COVID pandemic and the disruption to learning. 
I asked him, or one of my colleagues asked him about BTEC examinations, and he said that that's a matter that falls under your responsibility. Have you any plans to make changes to the BTEC courses in response to the disruption to learning? Um, so, uh, many of the BTEC courses are, are run through um, English exam boards. Um, and we will be continuing to engage with them to understand what they are doing, and uh, then we will disseminate that information um, down through the colleges. I think you know that we have gone to considerable lengths to adapt teaching uh, and to try to make sure that those young people who have practical courses that they need to follow and they need to be on site can be on site to do that. We will continue with that. But I must say, I mean, I think that um, it has been an extremely difficult and challenging uh, year for uh, young people who are anticipating exams in the near future. But we need to continue to engage uh, with the boards uh, in order to assess where they're at. Okay, thank you. I have Northern Ireland specific qualifications. So, 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 so CCE, uh, yeah. are working with. Yeah. Well, we're trying to find what degree of consistency we can have. We need to get also, the, as, as Mike said, the greatest degree of consistency um, so that our young people um, have qualifications that are consistent across the piece as well. Okay, thanks. And just Sinead then, finally. Okay, thank you, Minister. Um, in, on the 2nd of December, Richard Ramsey uh, briefed the, the committee in relation to the proposed voucher scheme uh, and the potential for the economic impact it would have. Now, he, he indicated that um, it would very much depend on the objective of the scheme in relation to what economic impact that it might have. So um, the, the scheme at that stage, of design stage, was very much about the high street and giving the high street a lift, uh, particularly those businesses that uh, seen a, a, a downfall, <laughs> a crash of their business dur during uh, the lockdowns. Um, so I was just wondering, Minister, have you given it any further consideration what the objective of that scheme is uh, and what the eligibility criteria is? And also, have you worked out who is going to get the vouchers? And have you worked out the timings? Because I'm also concerned that the vouchers need to be spent by March. Is this going to be a run to get money spent uh, out in the community and perhaps have another spike like the Eat Out to Help Out scheme? Um, so it's, it really Really is just try, trying to balance the value of the scheme um, uh, to those that it's intended to help support uh, and uh, what are your thoughts now on the design concept of the scheme and have you worked out what your uh, true objective is on giving that money out to the public? There are um, sort of a range of complexities with the scheme Sinead. Um, but uh, you will understand with the new innovative scheme that we are working on this, almost daily um, working on this, um, and people in the department have been tasked solely to, to put this scheme together. Can I reassure you um, and uh, people in general um, that of course we will take health advice into account. We don't live to ourselves in the Department of the Economy, um, and we will of course take health advice in the rollout of the scheme. Um, and see um, where uh, things are uh, as we progress towards that stage. The policy intent of the scheme is absolutely clear, and that is to support uh, retail and the high street, and I use the word high street in the loosest term uh, possible, um, but the um, other uh, objective is to ensure that, it, uh, that this is money that is spent supporting local businesses in local towns, Across Northern Ireland, and it will not be available for online shopping. That's uh, the clear policy intent uh, of the scheme, uh, and that hasn't changed, and I haven't changed my mind on that um, altogether. If you look at uh, what retail have been through, um, it's been an incredibly difficult period for retail, not just in Northern Ireland, um, but right across the British Isles and indeed right across uh, Europe. Um, but it's also been incredibly difficult for hospitality. So it will be supporting the high street in the loose sense of the term, um, but it will not be available for online shopping. We're working through the complexities of the scheme and we'll make announcements in due course. 
Can I just come back there, just uh, on the back of something that you said earlier, Chair, in relation to Part B of the the, the support scheme? I think that the, the problem with the pickup on that, uh, Minister, is about the eligibility. It's the criteria itself. Um, you know, even if we ran it for another week or so, it's not going to have. It's not going to help the uptake of it. It's because the criteria was so narrow, and I think that that it was a mistake leaving out the taxi drivers, that sector particularly, uh, in that scheme because um, that sector, you know, we were kind of led to believe that, that they wouldn't be excluded. So if it was opened up again or you were seeking to extend it, it would be, uh, it would be advisable to look at the eligibility so that uh, those that have really been affected uh, in the supply chain um, and the downturn that has taken place, even though they weren't mandated to close down, that they are also um, able to apply for support. Uh, and that's been the problem with this with the scheme. We only had about 31 uptakes in Derry City for that scheme itself. So that tells you all uh, in relation. You need to know about that the, the eligibility and the criteria for that scheme. It wasn't just uh, wide enough. Thanks. Thank you, um, mm -hmm. Minister. Thanks very much, and thanks to Mike and Paul as well. I think you have painted a very um, challenging picture in terms of the, the budget going forward into next year and in particular around the replacement for EU funding and I suppose many of us would never have expected that the British government was actually going to live up to the commitment to replace the, the EU funding like for like but it's a very very challenging picture that, that we're looking at and I'm sure yourself along with the, the finance minister and executive colleagues will be making the case um, to the British government for additional funding um, and certainly we, we will be supporting that. Um, but just to thank you again for being with us this morning. Um, and I know Mike is staying on. Yeah. So We're going to move into closed session um, to discuss an item with Mike. So this is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, so um, thanks, uh, members, for that. Um, just to, I suppose, briefly follow up on the discussion with the Minister, obviously there was updates in relation to um, the, the various supports that are uh, either open or are coming on stream very soon, and obviously we'll be all waiting to see if the, the wet pubs support scheme is um, announced later this yeah. week and, and the other ones in relation to large hospitality. Um, yeah. And um, we'll be keeping an eye for those. Um, and just, I suppose to give members the, the opportunity to um, raise any points. What's that? I, suppose, I don't know, somebody's phone was ringing, perhaps in the yeah. office. Hopefully. Um, <laughs> yeah, I suppose just the, the picture painted by the Minister and the Permanent Secretary in relation to the budget was very concerning. Um, and um, I, I suppose the Finance Minister laid that out after the spending review that it was. Um, not a, a good budgetary picture, but I suppose in particular the, the issue around the, the replacement for the EU funding is, is very concerning and the number of programmes that are dependent on that. Um, I would be Peter, suggesting that potentially we write to the British Chancellor um, expressing our very grave concerns over both the replacement EU funding, but also the ability of the executive to be able to um, generate any sort of economic recovery on the basis of the, the budget that we've received will be limited. Um, mm -hmm. And this is a time for um, economic stimulus, not austerity being mm -hmm. imposed uh, upon us um, to, to pay for the, the very much needed interventions that we've seen over the past year. So if members Chair are content. Members are content, yeah, yeah. content. OK, thank mm -hmm. you. Or are yeah, Chair, I just agree with you. There were, there were really two issues coming out of the meeting with the Minister this morning that would require red flagged. One was her, her comment that there would be significantly less funding than that which was expected from the Prosperity Fund. And as you say, that was very uh, starkly highlighted by the Finance Minister in the House this week. I think the other area that needs to be red flagged is a very serious area of concern when the Permanent Secretary said that we are now at the stage where legislation would have to be triaged or triaged um, before the end of um, the, the withdrawal period. That, that seems a very scary prospect. Who's doing that, that triage? Uh, can we see their traffic light list? Um, uh, and should perhaps we or others have an input into what should be uh, the top priority? Chair, the, the um, EU legislation dashboard 
um, that members have in the pack with the ministerial briefing is the most up-to-date traffic light system. In that, you'll see there are, I think, it's either three or four um, in black, mm -hmm. three, three or four uh, SRs in black. Those are ones where there would have been expected to have been outcomes and negotiations by now. That's what's being triaged. Yeah. So the, the, the process that I'm aware that's used is that's done in conjunction with the department developing the SR and TEO, because obviously they, um, <coughs> if you like, they're, they're the, the, um, the, the channel that, that all communication kind of goes through, and they're the coordinating unit on that. So I think that's what the, the Chair, it's what you had raised, and it's what the, the yeah. um, Permanent Secretary was referring to. They know what they need to do, um, but they just don't know the context. So it's very much going to depend on the context at the end of negotiations. the negotiations. Mm -hmm. But my assumption would be that they will, part of the triage process will be that they will work out a number of scenarios. Um, the department all along, Chair, has indicated that they have um, planned with a no-deal scenario in mind. Um, where these particular um, SRs are important is because they're around energy. And obviously there's a requirement to keep our, um, I suppose, to, to, to say it very bluntly, but keep the lights on. That, that isn't, isn't a concern in terms of what the protocol has set out and the acceptance that there's an all-island energy market, but it's just making sure the legislation's in place, um, and that's where the triaging process is at the minute. So we have our insight into that through our dashboard, but as soon as, as those become available, the department will send them on for committee approval. Um, so we're as involved as we possibly can be, and the work is ongoing on that. But it's it's just dependent on, I suppose, the next week or ten days. Chair, does that require that to come through the committee here? I mean, this in theory is our last meeting before. So, the... is that that particular question that we were asking around that group of SRs? That... Yep. Technically, um, Chair, they're likely to be negative resolution which means that they can be made, and then there's a grace period, obviously, as members know, where the committee can review and bring a prayer of annulment. So in a case of an emergency, uh, they can be made breaking the 21-day rule. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a process that can be massively speeded up, um, and they would be generally for continuity purposes. So what the department has suggested is that there won't be new... Um, um, th there won't be new policy change. It's just continuity of what's already there. I suppose we always expected that was going to be the case with the energy market. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really just the, the literal physical outworking of it now. I think continuity areas are probably reasonable. Yeah, I, I, I think, Chair, that, that was one they, they flagged up right from the beginning, and it's one they've put a lot of work into. So I, I think the department's ready for the minute they get... Um, a final pin down on what the deal is, and it, it shouldn't interfere with this. There's always been a, an understanding on all sides that this was an, an all island energy market that would not be interfered with and was necessary. Yeah. Um, so, yes, that's that's I think that's the positive outlook. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Mike did come back with a written briefing around the contingency on the energy leader today, so hopefully we'll get that. Okay, is, have any other members any comments they want to make in relation to the Minister's briefing? Okay, okay so where do we go now, Peter? Page matters five. Arising. Matters arising, so, arising yeah. Um, 5.1 then at page 52 of your pack, um, there is the clarifications from the Minister around the newly self-employed support scheme. Um, and obviously we discussed that with her during the briefing. Um, we have already raised our concerns around it. We, we have heard there today um, how she views it can be taken forward. Um, and I guess if members were content, we would look to support that, that call in relation to um, extending that out. Chair, I think, as you say, the Minister had, had clarified that if um, the, the NSESS was to be extended, it would probably mean a... a, a an additional fund that would require uh, executive budget. Um, 
I think the minister, you know, was, was very clear on that. That the, the money that was there has already been earmarked in the existing system and modelled to deliver on that. So if there was additional um, issues around people who weren't getting access to that scheme, it would have to require a further amount of funding being put in put in by the executive. The committee's already written um, to ask for further flexibility when gaps um, are identified with those that might not be able to access the, the first, this, this iteration of the scheme, particularly around the dates we discussed before um, as to when people started being self-employed and the 50% the um, criteria around having you know, their, 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 their earnings after reflect being self-employed. So that's already in, in with the department now. We've, we've written on that. Um, and then secondly, um, the next item is in relation to the um, corona or COVID restrictions, business support schemes. And again, we have um, discussed that with the Minister, so unless members have any additional comments to make. Can I just raise something, Chair? Um, the, the, in relation to the COVID restrictions, there is, um, well, it's not in line with the rest of the restrictions in the UK, and it's takeaways. Takeaways can't deliver after 11 p.m. And I'm just wondering why, can we ask the department why? Um, because, I mean, takeaway food, yeah, I think we have a letter. We, we have a letter in about that, that as well. well. So that'll, this, that'll come. Is, it, is it not the logic that um, off licenses have to close before eight o'clock? Basically, if you're able to order takeaway food after eleven, it may encourage people to gather in homes. Mm. That, is that not the logic of it. There's that's, a lot of night workers. Oh, as I well, absolutely not. agree. Yeah, I think they should be able to, but I think yeah, I suspect that's the logic. You know, if you're working. Yeah. Um, if we maybe hold the discussion on that with, until we Could come we to, get the to the letter, item? so unless Claire, you're coming in about the COVID ones or, or takeaways. No, right. yeah. thank you. Chair, just to flag up, um, as with you know, is the case at the minute because we've generated so much correspondence. This one is slightly out of date. Uh, the minister has given us more up-to-date figures today. Uh, this was a number of letters crossing. Um, so the just just to be wary with members in terms of the figures. Minister gave an updated set of figures today, so those figures are just slightly out of date. Yeah. Okay, so 5.3, then there is the department's response in relation to unemployment figures. Um, we had requested that mm -hmm. at the 25th of November meeting, um, and we discussed that with the, the minister this morning as well. Um, in the, the paper, it has highlighted that there were 249,000 furloughs in the north by August. 41, uh, or sorry, 51,400 were still furloughed at the end of September, um, and additionally, 78,000 self-employed individuals accessed the first um, income support scheme, and 70,000 claimed the second. Um, we also see in the the paper that the claimant count has doubled from pre-COVID levels, um, with 60,200 being um, in the claimant count in October. Um, there have been a number of redundancies and we've seen that yesterday in, in the media as well. Um, 1,240 in October alone would be in the highest, um, second highest monthly total on record. And um, there are, are modelled unemployment levels within that paper as well. And uh, this was obviously discussed with the minister. So it's um, to highlight those and um, less members have any additional comments they want to make off the back of that. I think it just demonstrates seven years of economic growth has been wiped out in seven months. And I think, Go ahead, and I think that we just need to prepare. Um, this is this is in advance of people coming off furlough, um, and we're going to see a real um, uptake on those figures in the next three months. I think we have already highlighted issues around furlough, but perhaps it will be no harm in, again, just emphasising the need for contingency post-furlough um, and the fact that there will be sectors that even come the end of March and potentially looking at whatever scenario we might be in that may still not be able to bring people back. Chair, I'm, I'm wondering would that be worth writing that to TEO because that will take executive coordination um, and executive funding. But copy it to um, all ministers. Okay. Great. Yeah. 
Okay, moving on then, 5.4, and it's another one we've discussed with the Minister today, but it's in relation to the prepaid card voucher um, scheme. Um, at the meeting on the 2nd of November, we received the briefing on that, um, and we had agreed to ask for more detail on the specific costs, um, etc., in relation to it. So the response highlights that the charges would be incurred as normal for um, a card, so it's to note unless members have any additional points. Great. Moving on then, page 76, 5.5, there is a departmental response regarding the job support scheme. Um, at our meeting on the 18th of November, members considered the current model for job support schemes and asked the department to provide an update on that um, and plans to respond in the longer term. So the response highlights the department's modelling. Again, it's to note, um, unless members have any additional points. Great. Um, then 5.6. Is a copy of five point five. The, 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 sometimes the pack does that; it duplicates things. Uh, it has a mind of its own sometimes. <laughs> five point seven. Then page one hundred. There's a departmental response in relation to the apprenticeship recovery scheme. At our meeting on the twenty fifth of November, members discussed the apprenticeship recovery scheme and asked for an update on that from the department, including in relation to the retention and recruitment and any implications for funding, which must be used by the end of the year. Um, it's a very useful briefing document actually is so it is and um, again I suppose not unexpected in terms of what, what it has laid out about um, some businesses not being able to bring people off furlough as as anticipated um, so I guess it's one we'll keep an, an eye to and, and go back mm -hmm. to the department on um, at a later point unless members have any additional points. No, great. Okay, 5.8 then, at page 105 of your pack, um, Pivotal's report on education skills and training for young people aged 14 to 19, um, which, you know, as we are uh, planning our micro inquiry at the end of January, it will be um, a useful reference point for that. So, unless mm -hmm. members have any additional points? No, it's an excellent report. Yeah. Thank you. 5.9 then is page 10 of the table pack is a response from the finance minister in relation to VAT payable on PP imported from the EU. Um, this issue has already been raised by the finance committee with the minister and its officials are working with the department for economy. The, min the minister highlights that the British government did not seek the extension for the north for the VAT free period to end the end of April 2021 as per EU members and that's why imports from the EU will, um, of PPE will attract VAT. So I guess another one of those um, unfortunate consequences. Um, but the Minister has highlighted that they are working on it. Yes, Chair, from what we understand, officials in both departments are seeing what kind of mitigations they can make. I think there's a lot of hope being put into localisation of production. Uh, that continues to ramp up. Um, so th th there's a hope that they can displace imports with locally produced PPA. Mm. Okay, um, 5.10 then, page 13 of table pack um, is Minister Weir's statement to the Assembly yesterday regarding the independent review of education. The paper references the 14 to 19 strategy, which also falls within the economy remit. The Minister's statement also relates to our micro-inquiry, which is happening at the end of January, on skills, and I hope that the special report and debate coming from that can help inform the Minister's policy development in this area. So it's to note unless members have any additional points. Noted. Noted at this stage. Thank you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> item number six then is an SR um, 2020-305, the Gas Amendment EU Exit Regulations NI 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 125 of your packs and at page 126 is the SR. Um, the Gas Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2020 will make a number of necessary amendments to the NI Energy legislation to ensure it continues to operate effectively from IP completion day at 11 p.m. on the 31st of December, following um, the exit from the European Union. The rule will come into operation on the 31st of December, um, and it is subject to negative resolution. So, members are content. We'll put the question. Read. The Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2020-295, the Gas Amendment EU Exit Regulations in Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule, subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report. 
Um, uh, item number seven then is another SR 2023-06, the Electricity Priority Dispatch Regulations NI 2020. There's a clerk's memo at page 172 of your packs and the SR is at page 174. This statutory rule amends the Electricity Priority Dispatch Regulations Northern Ireland 2012 to confer with Article 12 of the EU Electricity Recast Regulations 2019 2019-944. The rule will come into operation on the 31st of December 2020. Article 12 of the regulation relates to priority dispatch. Consequently, the Department was required to amend Article 11AB of the Electricity Northern Ireland Order 1992 to ensure that domestic legislation properly reflects EU law. Um, we considered the um, SL1 and agreed it um, on the 11th of November. This rule is also subject to negative resolution, so if members of content will put the question. Yep. Thank you. The Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2020 the Electricity Priority Dispatch, Dispatch Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and has no objection to the rule, subject to the examiner's strategy rule report. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Item number eight then is another SR, SR 2020-307, the Electricity Internal Markets Regulation NI 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 190 and the SR at page 191. The Electricity Internal Markets Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 will transpose elements of the Electricity Recast Directive EU 2019-944, the Directive on the Internal Market for Electricity. This directive repeals Directive 2009-72-EC. The SL1 was agreed by the Committee on the 18th of November, so this rule is also subject to negative resolution and if members are content, we will put the question. That the Committee for the Economy is considering the SR 2020-307, the Electricity Internal Markets Regulation, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule, subject to the Examiner Statutory Rules Report. Who says Brussels issued too many regulations? <laughs> Item number nine then is another SR 2020 the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Coronavirus Suspension of Liability for Wrongful Trading Regulations NI 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 240 and the SR is at page 242. Um, this statutory rule will, will, will restore provision in the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act suspending directors' liability for wrongful trading and extend the operation of that provision until the 30th of April 2021. ASL1 was agreed by the committee on the 2nd of December. So members of contempt will put the question. Contempt. Yes. That the Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2020 the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, Coronavirus Suspension of Liability for Wrongful Trading Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly subject to the Examiner of Statutory Bills report. Item number 10 then is SR 2020 321, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, Amendment of Certain Relevant Periods, Number 2, Regulations NI 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 250 and the SR at page 252. This rule um, makes provision to extend the duration of temporary measures restricting the use of statutory demands and winding up petitions introduced by the Act beyond their current expiration date of the 31st of December 2020. This rule extends these measures until the 31st of March 2021. It is subject to confirmatory resolution and a members of contempt will put the question. Please. That the Committee for the Economy has considered the SR 2020-321, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020, Amendment of Certain Relevant Periods, Number 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report. Item number 11 then is correspondence 11.1 .1 at page 259 of your pact is correspondence from the Committee for Infrastructure in relation to the financial assistance for taxi operators. The committee has written to the Economy Minister to seek support for taxi drivers. Um, we have also written to the Minister in some similar terms um, in relation to just general support and also the Part B of the scheme of the um, CRBSS. So unless members have any additional points. Okay. 11.2, page 261 of your pack is correspondence from the Committee for Infrastructure in relation to the EU Directive 2019-433. It's to note unless members have any additional points. 
Thank you. At page 263 of your pack, there is correspondence from the Committee for Finance in regards to Public Procurement Common Framework. The Finance Committee will keep members informed regarding the Common Framework. So if members are agreed, the Clerk will write to acknowledge and welcome this information. Thank you. 11.4 then, um, page 284, there's correspondence from the Committee for Justice regarding health protection regulations and highlighting the importance of the relevant minister to engage with the respective committees where the department contributes to or leads the regulations. So it's to note, um, unless members have any comments. Uh -huh. um, and then we're coming back to the takeaways issue yes. now. Um, 11.5 of page 288, there's correspondence from Domino's Pizza. Um, in regards to them raising concern about the 11 p.m. curfew on the delivery of food um, in the context of the current uh, COVID regulation. Um, so, members, I think she, um, Claire wanted to come in on this. Hi, thanks, Chair. Um, no, it was just in relation to the comment. I, I don't entirely see the issue why you wouldn't be able to deliver past um, the, the prescribed time. You know, and I'm thinking in particular of frontline workers who don't work nine to five or who don't come to eight. And you know, maybe after a long day at work, they're for getting food and delivery and all of that. Um, you know, so. I appreciate Mr. Stalford's points in relation does this give rise to house parties, but that in itself is a, is a breach of the restrictions. So Just to be clear, that is not my view. I was simply okay. expressing that that is probably the logic, but it is not okay. my view. I don't think there's any logic in the position. Just to be clear okay. on that. <laughs> Sorry, Claire. Okay. No, 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 Chris, you're, you're grand. It's just um, we, we had a lot of correspondence in the constituency in relation to it. Um, and it was namely from those businesses themselves. I wasn't getting frontline workers saying that they wanted to, to eat anything at two o'clock in the morning. But I'm just, I'm just considerate of that. And I don't think any other jurisdiction in the rest of the UK or other region in the UK um, has that. But it's, it's just a thought to add in there that there are reasons as to why people eat out of hours. And, you know, maybe that's as valid as doing it for house parties or anything like that. So... When you come home after yeah. when you come home after a late night sitting at Stormont, for example. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, members are going to will forward the correspondence onto the department for their consideration yeah. um, and urge them to look at it. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, at eleven point six, then page two hundred and ninety of your pack is the sixteenth report of the examiner of statutory rules. Um, to note, unless members have any points. Not it. <clears throat> Number. Right. 11.7, um, at page 41 of your table pack, there's a ministerial statement in relation to the North-South uh, Ministerial Council Trade and Business Development Sector. Um, we, the Minister obviously made that statement yesterday, so unless members have any additional comments they want to make on it. Sorry. Noted. And 11.8 then is the Minister's statement in relation to the NSMC Tourism Sector meeting. Um, again, it's to note unless members have any points. That's grand. Thank you. Um, page 51 of the table pack is the ministerial statement from the finance minister on the dormant accounts fund. So again, to note, unless there's comments the members want to make. Um, 11.10 then, um, page 57 of your table pack is correspondence from the lecturer requesting to present results of their consultation on the future strategy of Queen's University to the committee. This was developed through engagements with students and lecturers um, to provide this uh, an alternative to the papers produced by two consultancy um, firms. So, um, there, if, I don't know if members seen both UCU and Student Union have, have had some commentary around this issue in terms of how Queen's has engaged with students and lecturers and, and their concerns, I suppose, around the, the development of that strategy. So it could be interesting to hear. Mm -hmm. um, unless members have any additional comments around that. Fine. Chair, we'll go ahead and we'll get a, a, a briefing organised. Um, okay. I'm going to move to 14. Um, is a UK common framework outline agreement late payment in commercial transactions? It's at page 59 of your table pack. Um, the proposed framework outlines agreement is it intended as an acknowledgement that it is in the interest of the four administrations to continue to collaborate closely on policy development in this area. The agreement seeks to establish light-touch mechanisms for governance, information exchange and dispute resolution, 
that are proportionate and in line with the framework principles agreed by the Joint Ministerial Council in 2017 and endorsed by the Executive in June of this year. The um, common framework itself is expected in um, January. So the committee is informed that the common framework will not interface with the protocol and that this is a settled and non-contentious issue. It's not expected that the British government will diverge from EU policy in this area. However, it reserves the right to do so. Um, just to highlight to members that this, um, this summary is considered to be confidential at this point. Great. Um, there is in paragraph 3 of the paper, page 60 of your table packet, asks whether the committee wishes to scrutinise the common framework and if so, if it is willing to do this within the 21 day sitting day period outlined. Um, Annex C of the paper at page 65 in the table pack indicates that the Minister has written to executive colleagues to inform them she has approved phase 3 of this common framework. So um, I, I'm sure members are happy to scrutinise the common yeah. framework. Thank you. And unless members have any um, other points on it, um, we will also seek to engage with stakeholders. Um, around the common framework um, and also to receive a briefing from the department and share that summary with the EU Affairs Manager if members are content. Mm -hmm. Item number 15 then is another common framework summary, specified quantities and packaged goods. Um, at page 67 of the table pack correspondence from the Minister regarding the common framework and specified quantities and packaged goods. Um, the North has always based its weights and measures legislation on the equivalent British legislation, modified as necessary to reflect the different administrative and legal arrangements here. The developed framework reflects the current approach underpinning frictionless trade between Britain and the North, enabling satisfactory working practices and affording protections to both businesses and consumers on the key principles of consumer choice, quality control, fair trade and consumer confidence. It's a non-legislative framework. Um, the committee is informed that the common framework will not interface with the protocol and that this is a settled and non-contentious issue. BES engaged with the Food and Drink Association ANI, and there were no comments offered by the deadline in mid-November. The summary again is considered to be confidential at this stage. And again, at paragraph 3 of the paper, page 70 of your table pack, it asks whether the committee is, um, wishes to scrutinise and if so, if it's willing to do within the 21-day sitting period. Um, the Minister has also indicated that the devolved administration worked with the British Government to formulate the summary for the framework. So if members are content to, to scrutinise it within the period um, mm. and also to engage with to begin the engagement with stakeholders. Um, and if members are content, we will receive a briefing with the, from the Department and share the summary with the ERA Committee, as it will also be of interest to them, to them as well as the EU Affairs Manager. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving back then to item 12, which is any other business. Um, John O'Dowd has indicated, Chair. Yep, go ahead, John. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's a matter that's just come to my attention this morning. Uh, I have had a, a contractor on to me who is supplying self employed workers from Poland to a contract in England from the 1st of January onwards, and I can't get information anywhere. Uh, and he's been on to the Home Office and, and different departments trying to get information as to how he ensures those workers will have access and be allowed to work uh, in England as self-employed contractors from the 1st of January. Is, is there any way the committee could write to the department or maybe even to the Home Office and ask for clarification on the status of self-employed European workers coming in to work in contracts? Chair, I think we've had some... Um continuity secondary legislation through that touches on this um, around people working via an agency or, or via an agent as the contractor would be but I, I think it's probably safest to go back to the department and ask, ask for clarification as to how that will actually work in this situation so if there's if there's any correspondence that Mr O'Dowd can forward to me from the company I can engage directly with them and we can just okay, see exactly yeah. how that will work out. Because I'm sure there was something. I just can't remember exactly what it was. Okay. Yep, members I appreciate members. that. Thank you. Okay, um, Sinead. Um, uh, just uh, today and 
a paper, I don't know which paper it is, but um, there's an article about Ulster Bank, there's rumours about uh, its exit, uh, and I think that that's going to have significant uh, repercussions here in Northern Ireland. Can we bring Ulster Bank in for a briefing and ask what's going on? Chair, yeah, I, I, I've understood there's been rumblings in the media for quite some time yeah. that they would exit the market in the south. Um, and now, obviously, that, that has speculation has turned <coughs> here as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a sale potentially as well. So there's a lot of issues there. Yeah. So if members are content, we'll request a briefing on that for clarification. Sure, if anybody's a, a customer of the Ulster Bank, they'll have had correspondence from them in the last mm -hmm. couple of weeks uh, indicating that from some date next year, we're as a, I can declare an interest as an Ulster Bank customer, uh, that, it, that although they will continue to use the name Ulster Bank, it will become uh, Nat West. Yeah, oh. there's talk about them coming out now of Northern Ireland. Uh, maybe the same area yeah. they're talking about. That, that might, Chair, that might relate to um, branch closures. I don't mm. know if members recall when the Santander merged mm -hmm. with... Yeah. Um, yep. They closed more branches than the one left. Yeah. Well, Chair, we seek, a, we seek a briefing on that. Yeah. Yeah. And Peter, we had asked around the banks more generally yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. to get briefing and we had corresponded with the, the Finance Committee. Yes, the, yes who... who Kind of speak on behalf of banks. We we developed a relationship with them. If there are a number of banks that are you know that are the main banks here, and it would be useful to hear from them directly. You know, yeah. If we could do that, Bank of Ireland are also doing a strategic review, which could incur branch close, closures as well, and that's all going to have an impact on our um, unemployment figures. I think um, this is, is yet another one of those accelerated trends um, where, where banks have reviewed whether a physical presence has been necessary. And obviously during COVID, there's been so much less contact, contactless payments and less banking physically and so on. So, yeah, there's a huge issue there. We, we get our, our um, we get onto the banks about coming in and briefing. Sure, I think it would be important. I know from our experience in North Dyne, a number of banks closed. There's little or no consultation with anyone. And just there's an arrogance about it, mm. uh, the way they've done it, and and just told us that we're doing it, and, and there was you know no flexibility or no other options looked at, and yet where they are located in busy shopping centres, they are busy. You know they've centralised a lot of their facilities, so there is still a market out there, although it has changed, but there's still a market for it, and people really do like a lot of. People out there still like going to the bank and, and doing their business directly with over the counter, and I think it's something we need to move on quickly because my experience is they're they're ruthless and, and it's all about money and money driven, and, and they, they don't care about the customer. In fact, some of in our branches, the Ulster Bank, are closed at lunchtime, which is ridiculous, and people have to stand in the street trying to get in. Like we need to get realistic, but no, I think we need to move quickly on it, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, John. You know, you know, it's supportive of all the comments of the committee around the banks, uh, but it also shows the importance of rural post offices who also carry out banking services. Uh, and as part of the discussion, maybe look at the role and even enhancing the role uh, of post office because we're, uh, we're losing rural post offices who provide services to rural communities, including banking. Actually, it's got to the point that there are so few banks about the place that this is no longer an isolated rural issue. So if you're if you're living in a housing a housing estate in the on the sort of suburbs of Belfast, your nearest bank is miles away too. You know, so it has become a, a serious issue in terms of provision of banking services anywhere in general. Chair, that's maybe the other angle to pick up as well. I know members are probably aware, uh, more than most because of constituency, that the post office has expanded its its range of, of um, mm. services around this and, and will allow you to bank on behalf of banks. Mm. might be worth getting something from them as yeah. well, actually, just to see where that's going. Yeah, that would be helpful. Go ahead okay, so um, members are happy. We'll, we'll request those um, and that's it. So item number 13 is the time, date and place of our next meeting, which at this point is scheduled for the 13th of January. So, um, happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Thank you. Happy Christmas. You too. Christmas, everyone. See you later. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.